time to get inspired, develop, and improve your yoga knowledge in English. You listen to Your Yoga in English, a podcast for non-native English-speaking yogis that want to practice or teach yoga worldwide. My name is Ami, the founder of Enga Unite, and here to guide you on your way to become the confident, effective, and knowledgeable English-speaking yogi you want to be. This week, many of us are celebrating Christmas. It's not celebrated all over the world, but it is usually a period in which we practice or we spend less time on the mat. It's a time in which a lot of people experience stress or maybe even anxiety. So I thought it would be a really good time to speak about how we can practice yoga off the mat. All of the teachings and all of the lessons that we learn on the mat are meant for us to also practice off the mat. So in our daily life, when we are speaking to other people, when we consider new things, the way that we act, behave, the way that we speak. So this time really is a good time to reflect on what you have learned in your practice and how you can take all of this into your daily life especially the way the the thing that I'm going to speak about today is how to practice yoga off the mat during the holidays. Like mentioned, not everyone will be celebrating Christmas this time of the year or celebrating Christmas at all. So if this is not applicable to your time of the year, you can take all of what I'm saying as in your daily life or when you are celebrating, for example, the Chinese New Year or the Thai New Year. Whenever it is, all of the things I'm going to share are applicable to any holiday season or any festive season for you. So the reason why I want to speak to you about this today and speak about practicing yoga of the mat and especially doing this during the holidays is that many actually can't keep up with the routine that they have normally. So for many people, this means that they have less time to themselves. I already said that if you are not celebrating Christmas or if you're not celebrating anything festive in December, this chat will still apply to you because the holiday season or any busy season for you can be that you spend less time on the mat and that you want to practice yoga off the mat as well. So if you are not celebrating, you can still keep listening and apply this to whenever it suits you. Because we all go through times where we have other responsibilities and these responsibilities can take over. They take over our routine, the way we behave, the way that we act. They can really be a defining factor in the way that we show up as ourselves and with the people or around the people that we teach as yoga teachers, but also in our family and with our friends. So during celebrations and festival periods, you might have extra commitments. And these commitments could be travel, could be that you have to go somewhere else. It could be family gatherings, meeting friends, maybe wrapping presents, maybe food shopping, writing Christmas cards or festive cards, whatever it is. There are other commitments that you normally don't have or normally to a lesser extent, so way less. Whatever it is that takes up your time at certain points in the year, for many of us, this results in having less time on the mat. In periods in which we spend less time on the mat, like during the holidays, can feel very unsettling. And for many, our yoga practice is very solitary. So that means that you practice it alone. Even if you practice in a group setting, it's a practice that you go through by yourself. It's personal development, your personal practice, your own space, your own time. It's a personal experience. So especially if you're very dedicated to your practice, it may feel challenging to not have that same time available, that me time or maybe the time for self-care. You just have other commitments that you need to show up for. So when you spend less time on the mat and when you have less time to actually take care of yourself, 
It could be that you feel unbalanced or unstable or unsettled or ungrounded. It may be that you feel anxious or frustrated or irritable, maybe even guilty or sad. And I want you to know that all of the feelings that you experience, and especially during this time of the year, are common. That many, many other people feel stress around this time. So that you're not the only one. And everything that you feel right now, maybe it's not what you um, prefer to feel, but it's nothing to be ashamed of and nothing to be or to feel bad about. So what could help is seeking support from other yogis or going back to your personal practice. You can also seek support from friends, from family. All of this really can do wonders because you're not in this alone. The thing that could help you, not the most, but one of these things that really could help you is to take your practice off the mat. And we speak about this a lot in our yoga practice. There are many yoga teachers that speak about practicing off the mat. But I do believe that not everyone actually does this or knows how to do this. So even though you may take some time of work and the events around the holidays are all centered on other things, everything that you do uses up your energy. And this can be energy that's emotionally, physically, energetically, mentally, spiritually, everything. It's energy that you don't spend on yourself. So if this period makes you feel unbalanced too, I want to remind you of the teachings of yoga, the things that we do learn on the mat and the things that we can now take off the mat. So the teachings of yoga, two very specific things that I definitely think you can take off the mat straight away are the Sutra by Patanjali, but also the Yamas and the Yamas. And also your personal development, your personal development in general, especially the Yamas and the Yamas teach us to better deal with our own thoughts and behavior. And especially to do this, in social situations. So all of these feelings, our behavior, our acts, our thoughts are tested during the holidays because it's generally a time that you're more in contact with other people or have to deal with other people that you don't usually deal with as much. I do believe that it's a really good time for you to revise what the yamas and yamas mean to you and how you can apply this knowledge to help you keep practicing yoga off the mat during the holidays or any other stressful period. So let's revise the, the yamas and niyamas. What are they again? For those that have done yoga teacher training, I'm sure that you are familiar with them and that you've seen them before. For those that haven't done yoga teacher training, you might know them anyway, but I do recommend you read up on them or you, you look up on the internet or in your books, what they mean and how they are defined according to the philosophy. And this is just a quick revision. So the yamas represent the right way of living. They speak about self-restraint and so-called ideal behavior. And they are often described as morals or ethics. And I would define them as the way we speak to each other or speak to ourselves and how we be other people and deal with others because they particularly affect our relationships, the, the relationship we have with ourselves, but also the relationship with people in the world. You can look at the yamas as the don't do this list. It's a list for nurturing your relationships. Remember the one that you have with yourself, with others, but also the world. There are five yamas and they are ahimsa, non-harming or non-violence in the way you think, in the way you speak and in the way you act. In yoga, they often say in uh, thought, word and deed. And re really a translation or synonyms are they think, speak and act. Then we have sajja, which means truthfulness. And truthfulness as well in the way that we speak, but also in the way that we behave. 
Do you really listen to your body and are you true to it? Do you listen to it needs and do you act upon it? Then we have Asteya, which is non-stealing. And non-stealing can sound very uh, practical, that you don't take what doesn't belong to you. But I also want you to look at it in a way that's more metaphorical. So are you stealing energy from yourself or energy from other people? Are you asking too much from yourself or asking too much from other people? So look at it in a practically and in a metaphorically way. Now we have brahmacharya, which is right use of energy. And this right use of energy, according to the philosophy, is often described as celibacy, which means that you only have sex for the right purposes or that you don't have sex at all. But in our modern world, I like to look at it as right use of energy in every way. So do you really take care of yourself or take a step back when your body needs a pause or when your body needs a rest? Or do you really spend enough time on your practice, for example? Or do you really spend the, the energy that you need for certain things on the things that need them? And then we have aparigraha, which is non-greed and non-hoarding. Non-greed and non-hoarding means that you don't take more than you need. So it can sound a little bit like non-stealing, but it's more in a way that we don't take what we need or already have or take more of that because we only need so many things and often a lot less than we actually think. So this is a very quick summary, very small summary of what the yamas entail. And as I mentioned, this is the don't do this list. So we don't want to be untrue. We don't want to steal. We don't want to spend our energy on the things that don't really are not necessary. We don't want to be greedy. We don't want to hurt. And we don't want to, I think that was it. <laughs> I think we don't want to harm and be violent. So the don't do this list. Then there are the niyamas. The niyamas are positive activities or recommended responsibilities that include being observant, thoughtful, and considerate. So the niyamas teach us healthy habits, and they teach us discipline and contentment, a ways to feel liberated. And I do look at them in a way that they are tools to create an idea of a responsible lifestyle, but also for spiritual enlightenment, is that if this is something that you are working towards. So in contrast to the yamas, the niyamas are often the do this list. So the other opposite, we want to do more of this. The niyamas include saucha, which is cleanliness, and cleanliness physically, but also mentally and spiritually and energetically and emotionally. So all of the things that do take up our energy and how we can clean from that. Often we do this in self-care or we use our asana practice. We can use journaling activities to keep the body clean all around. So spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, and must have forgotten one, but didn't mention. So then that's socha, clean cleanliness. Then we have santosha, which is contentment. And contentment is a big thing and will look a little bit different to everyone. But contentment could mean that you are happy or that you are acceptance, that you allow things to be the, the, the way they are. And we just accept the way they are in the present moment. We are happy with what is and we are happy with who we are. So contentment. Now we have tapas, which is discipline. And discipline will definitely look different for everybody. Is this a discipline to get up early in the morning? Or is this a discipline to always eat vegan meals? Or is this the discipline to actually show up for your practice every day? And I don't believe that there's one way to do this right or one way to do this wrong, because it really depends on your dharma, your purpose, the way that you want to live your life 
and the way that you feel you need to live your life. Then we have Svadhyaya. So study of the self and of yogic texts. Svadhyaya is one of the things that I find very, very important myself or personally. It's one of the things that I include in our yoga teacher trainings all the time. Because our self-study shows us what we really want to do and have to do in this life. It shows us our purpose and it shows us ways to understand ourselves better, the way that we show up, the way that we speak, the way that we act, and they include yogic texts. So self-study can be personal development, but it can also be reading and studying yogic texts. Then we have the last one, and I always find it a little challenging to pronounce this one, but I'm going to try. It's Isvara Pranidhana, and it's surrendering or surrender to a higher being or contemplation of a higher power. And this may sound a little spiritual, and I really do believe that it really, ha- that again, it has your interpretation of this. So according to yogic text, it would be surrender to a, a god or a deity, but it could be your interpretation. It could also be surrender as itself, surrendering to the present moment, to the things that maybe you're not good at, or the things that don't go well for you, surrender to accept or to allow. So this is a very quick summary of the niyamas. And like I said, the yamas are the do not do this list. The yamas, sorry, the yamas are the do not do this list. And the niyamas are the do this list. So we want to do more of that. Now, all the yamas and niyamas are social ethics. They are morals and rules for behavior. So whatever your background is, or maybe your points of view, the interpretations of these ethics will differ. So they are different for everybody. The way that you read them and perceive them might also be different now than in a few years from now. I personally study the yamas and the yamas every year again, because I always find new things. And as you grow in your practice, but also as you get older and you have different experiences, your interpretation of these yamas and niyamas will change. So it's okay, because they really make sense for you in the present moment. So for that reason as well, learning about them in your yoga teacher training is great. We do need to know about them. But you also need to know in what way they apply to your life and how you can apply them in your life if you don't do this already. So this contributes to your self-study and the development of your practice, the development of the practice on the mat, but also off the mat. It helps you, the studies of the yamas and niyamas, and especially svadhyaya, helps you to understand your purpose, your dharma. It also teaches you to take care of yourself and take care of others, and to cultivate deeper and healthier relationships. That's true. I can't find a lot of, yes, there's a lot of different interpretations. So do make an effort and find out what they mean to you right now and how you can apply this in your life, Alessandra. So let me think, where was I? So this contributes to your self-study and the development of your practice on and off the mat. So to practice yoga off the mat during the holidays, let's reflect on the meaning of the yamas and niyamas and what they mean to you. I've given you a quick summary, but I want you to think of it for yourself. If you think of non-harming, ahimsa, what does that mean to you? I want you to take a moment to really think about what this could mean for you right now. And instead of just writing down, not hurting anyone or not hurting anything or myself, think of real life examples in your job or in your life, among your family members, among the people that you're going to see during the holidays. In what way would you not hurt anyone, anything or yourself? And examine your answers under a magnifying glass and look at them from your point of view. So literally, but also metaphorically, emotionally, 
Maybe you had a physical sensation to it, a mental thought or a fear that comes up. And if you want to, you can do this spiritually as well. So really think of all the yamas and the yamas. Maybe grab your list. I will summarize them at the end again for you. Really reflect on them and what they could mean in your life during the holidays. Gonna give you a few examples. Just some examples of very practical situations in which we can apply the yamas and the yamas of the mat or apply the teachings of yoga of the mat. Examples are that you show up at the dinner table telling people why you choose to eat vegan meals. You tell them why you choose to eat vegan meals. meals. Instead of telling them that they have to eat vegan meals. Does that make sense? So you show up as a yogi, sharing what you know, sharing what you have learned, and sharing also what you have studied about yourself. So your self-studies like Yaya, and maybe Sadhya, truthfulness, instead of telling people what they have to do or what they should do, because that's part of their own development, and you have already done that. There's no need to compare, but you can tell them why you do it. So instead of telling people what to do, we tell them why you do it. So it can be a source of inspiration. Then another example could be that a sister or your brother or a family member tells you that they didn't like your Instagram post and you automatically defend yourself. So instead of automat automatically defending yourself, you just accept it and you let it be. So this could be non-harming or non-violence in the way that you think, speak and act. You accept what, what, where they are at in their life and you just let it be. Another example could be when the social events you go to or that you are part of get too crowded or too loud or too hectic. You take a deep breath and embrace the fact that you're surrounded by your loved ones. Very often, we want to escape situations that we feel uncomfortable. But ask yourself, why do I feel uncomfortable? And could you, for example, surrender? <laughs> I told you earlier, I find that one difficult to pronounce. But could you surrender to the present moment? Another example is that when the food is burned or not all the ingredients are there, that you do not get upset and instead you choose to have an equally good time appreciating whatever food is there, even though normally you wouldn't eat the same things. So this would mean contentment or santosha, even though it's not what you actually were to do in your, in your daily life, in your daily routine. Right now, you can be content with whatever is there. Another one and the last one for today is when your grandparents or another family member give you the same book as last year as a present or they give you the same pair of socks or a pair of socks that you know that you will never use. You give it away to someone, maybe someone that can actually benefit from it. Or you give it away to a thrive shop, the second hand shop, and they can give it to someone or charity rather. So in that case, you would practice non-greed and non-hoarding, but also non-stealing. So aparigraha and asteya. So think of real life situations for yourself, things that actually happen during your holidays or things that are likely happening during your holidays and how you can better react to it, how you can better speak about it or speak in a situation, but also act and behave. Or how can you better accept what is and maybe you wouldn't do normally or wouldn't like normally. So the examples I gave you are very common things that happen during the holidays. You can easily, easily, easily practice yoga off the mat in these situations. And they probably have nothing to do with yoga as you knew it or with yoga as you've seen or have practiced it on the mat. But they give you the opportunity to practice it off the mat. As Tisha Alessandra says, I think I will face a lot of these situations. <laughs> well, that gives you the practice or the excellent opportunity to practice off the mat. So 
The aim or my intention of this training today is for you to reflect on the yamas and the yamas and what these ethics or ideal behavior mean to you and how they can be integrated into your personal lifestyle. Remember to feel free to interpret them the way that you want to and the way that makes sense to you. But also feel or stay open that your interpretation of these yamas and niyamas can change over time. So remember that we all come from different places. We all have different experiences, different backgrounds. We grew up with different thoughts and behavior and different cultures. So there's not one way to do this right or to do this wrong. There's not one way to live by them. To give you a little extra help, so a little, a little bit extra help to help you get started with this reflection, consider the following questions and see if you already apply the yamas and the yamas to your life. And if not, what they mean to you. So these are questions to reflect on them in general. And I would recommend to reflect on each yama and the yama individually afterwards. So grab a journal or grab a piece of paper or open the notes on your phone and write with me. Question one, how has yoga changed or affected your life off the mat already? Written here, ahimsa is especially no violence psychologically. It could be, it could be that's your interpretation of it. And there are many different ways to look at it. Question two, in what ways do you apply any of these things to your life already? So in what ways do you apply any of the lessons you've learned on the mat, of the mat already? Question three, what new lessons have you learned today, maybe in this training or maybe on your mat earlier, about the niyamas and niyamas? or yogic philosophy in general? And how can you take that into your life during the holidays? So is there anything that you've learned today or recently? And how can you take that into your life or into your life during the holidays? And then write some examples, some examples of how you could get off the mat during the holidays. So I have listed some very common situations or scenarios, and maybe you have some of yourself, because very often we spend it with the same people and we kind of have an idea of what's going to happen. Also use these assumptions to analyze your thoughts and the way that you show up during the the holidays. So as a final note, understanding what the yamas and niyamas mean to you will help to give you a very quick reminder when you can't spend as, time, spend as much time on the mat. So they give you a reminder for whenever, thing, whenever, whenever times are challenging or whenever something unexpected happens and you need to quick, uh, quickly react or act. So this can help you in all areas of your life. It can help you understand and help others better. It can help you deal with your relationships better. It can help you deal with difficult scenarios or or situations. And it also helps you to understand other people's thoughts and behavior without the urge for trying to change someone. So without feeling that you need to change someone's perspective or their behavior. As a result of doing this study, You will have the tools for communicating with others and not just tell them that they are wrong. It's an opportunity for you to inspire others. So rather than to change everyone, you can give them your perspective and inspire them. All right. So I hope all of this has been useful. I would love to know from you how you will apply this during the holidays or if you listen to this after how you have applied this during the holidays and you can send me a message or um, my email so annie at engayunite.com you can send me a message on facebook in our facebook group and here on instagram as well if you joined me later and you haven't seen everything you can watch it back from the start Or you can also listen to it on the podcast very soon. And let me see, because I see comments here on Facebook that have come in later. 
So I would love to hear from you, actually. I would love to hear from you now how you apply this in your life and what the yamas and the yamas mean to you personally. What do they mean? Okay, if you have any questions, let me know as well. If you have any questions about this, let me know as well. And always feel free to send a message. We're here on Facebook, the Teach Yoga and English Support and uh, Teach Yoga and English Support Group on Facebook and on Instagram at Anga Unite. Everyone, I won't see you again before Christmas. So if you are celebrating, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas from my team and me. Sending you lots of love. You listen to Your Yoga in English, brought to you by Enga Unite, a unique online learning platform for non-native English-speaking yogis. If you liked what you learned today, I would love for you to leave a review. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us at Enga Unite. Join the community and become a member of the Teach Yoga in English support group. Check out our continuing education membership that offers you the chance to develop your skills and expertise through self-paced learning and live classes and training. If you want help understanding what you need to improve and create an action plan to achieve the goals that you have for your career as an international yoga teacher, book a free discovery call with me, Annie. You can find all the links this is in your the show time to invest time in your personal and professional development.